Welcome to a journey through time and history. Today, we embark on an exploration of one of the most enigmatic and captivating civilizations in the annals of human history, the Aztec civilization. In this video, we'll delve into the heart of the Aztec world, unearthing their remarkable achievements, complex society, and the enduring legacy they've left behind. The Aztecs, a Mesoamerican civilization, flourished from the 14th to the 16th century, primarily in what is now modern-day Mexico. Mexico, a land with an ancient history that stretches back 20,000 years, bore witness to a tapestry of civilizations before the Aztecs. The Teotihuacan, Monte Alban, Palenque, and Tajin cultures graced these lands with their own unique contributions. The roots of the Aztec civilization, fascinatingly, trace back to the grandeur of Teotihuacan, a bustling city that thrived during the classic period of 200 to 700 AD. Situated in central Mexico, Teotihuacan not only served as the capital of a small empire, but also engaged in extensive trade with cities throughout Mesoamerica, including the illustrious Maya cities. However, the decline of Teotihuacan marked the beginning of a tumultuous era, characterized by warfare and conflict, spanning from 700 to 900 AD. During this time, several fortified cities rose to prominence, including Xochicalco, Cacaxtla, and Teotenango. This turbulent period was followed by the rise of the Toltec civilization, spanning from 900 to 1150 AD. The Toltecs, with their capital at Tula, maintained extensive trade networks with distant regions of Mesoamerica, although they did not exercise the same level of dominance over central Mexico as their Teotihuacan predecessors did. Aztec chroniclers hailed this era as a golden age, characterized by the flourishing of arts, culture, and poetry contests in place of conflicts. The fall of Tula coincided with a significant development. A wave of Nahuatl-speaking Aztec immigrants arrived in central Mexico during the 12th century AD. The exact origins of the Aztec people remain shrouded in mystery. It is believed that they began as a northern tribe of nomadic hunter-gatherers whose name derived from their homeland, Aztlan, which translates to white land in their native Nahuatl language. According to legend, the Aztec ancestors embarked on a long journey southward from Aztlan, which is believed to be in the north. While some experts consider Aztlan a myth, it remains undiscovered to this day. Central to Aztec beliefs was the myth of their origins. They recounted how the earth goddess, Cuatlicu, became pregnant with Huitzilopochtli, their patron god, after being impregnated by a ball of feathers. Envious, her children, including Coyolchauqui and the stars, sought to kill her but were thwarted by Huitzilopochtli. Guided by Huitzilopochtli, the Aztecs embarked on a journey south, seeking the prophesied sign an eagle perched on a cactus, devouring a snake. Interestingly, the term Aztec wasn't employed as an endonym by the Aztecs themselves. Instead, it surfaces in various migration accounts of the Aztecs, describing the tribes that embarked on the journey from Aslan together. One account recounts a pivotal moment on this journey when Huitzilopochtli declares to the followers, Now, no longer is your name Azteca. You are now Mexitan or Mexica. This transformation of identity marked a significant moment for the Mexica tribe, solidifying their distinctiveness on their journey. Their quest took 52 years, akin to an Aztec century, and culminated in the discovery of an island with a sacred cactus in the year 1324 AD. Upon reaching their chosen land, the Aztec people experienced a profound and rapid transformation. In just about 300 years, they evolved from a nomadic tribe into one of the most astonishing cultures in Mesoamerica, and perhaps the entire world. When the Aztecs arrived in the Anahuac Valley, they were initially perceived as the least civilized by neighboring groups. However, the Aztecs displayed a remarkable thirst for knowledge, absorbing wisdom and culture from others, notably the ancient Toltecs. To the Aztecs, the Toltecs were the architects of all culture. Their legends connected the Toltecs with Quetzalcoatl, 
the feathered snake deity, and a legendary city known as Talon, often intertwined with the ancient Teotihuacan. During the 13th and 14th centuries, Culhuacan to the south and Azcapotzalco to the west reigned as the most influential city-states in the Lake Texcoco region, extending their rule across the land surrounding the lake. When the Mexica arrived as semi-nomadic tribes in the Anahuac Valley, they found themselves with no place to settle. Initially, they sought refuge in Chapultepec, but this area was under Azcapotzalco's rule, and they were eventually expelled. They then turned to Culhuacan, where in 1299, the ruler Cocoxtli granted them permission to settle in Tizapan, a desolate place shunned by others. The Mexica began to assimilate the culture of Culhuacan marrying Culhuacan women who played a crucial role in educating their children. Their interactions culminated in a request to the Culhuacan ruler in 1323, seeking his daughter to be transformed into the goddess Yao Chihuatl. Tragically, the Mexica sacrificed her, deeply shocking the people of Culhuacan, leading to their expulsion. Forced to flee, in 1325, the Mexica reached a small islet in the center of Lake Texcoco. On this island, the Aztecs founded Tenochtitlan, a city that was probably among the largest cities in the world of those times, a city that was a city of great wealth, of astounding beauty and impressive scale, which is now known as Mexico City. The oval red fruit of the cactus, symbolizing the human heart, has endured as a national emblem of Mexico has its roots here. It was here that the Aztec civilization thrived. Our understanding of Aztec society is drawn from a rich tapestry of sources, each offering unique insights into the complexities of this ancient civilization. Archaeological remains ranging from grand temple pyramids to humble thatched huts provide a tangible connection to the material aspects of the Aztec world. Yet, to grasp the historical context and significance of these artifacts, archaeologists often turn to a mosaic of knowledge from diverse sources. A wealth of written texts both by the indigenous people and the early Spanish colonizers, serves as a crucial reservoir of information about pre-colonial Aztec history. These texts offer a window into the political histories of various Aztec city-states and the lineages of their rulers. Pictorial codices, some entirely glyph-based, provide additional layers of understanding. In the post-conquest era, a new chapter in documentation unfolded. Many texts were written in Latin script, crafted by literate Aztecs or Spanish friars who engaged in conversations with the native people. These narratives delve into customs, stories, and the intricate tapestry of Aztec life. The synergy of archaeological evidence and written records creates a more comprehensive picture, allowing us to piece together the puzzle of Aztec society. It's through these multifaceted lenses that we navigate the intricate landscape of an ancient civilization. During the initial period, the Mexica hired themselves out as mercenaries in conflicts between Nahua groups, which disrupted the balance of power between city-states. Gradually, they garnered enough prestige to secure royal marriages. The dynamics shifted when Tezozomoc, the lord of the Tepanec Nahua, held sway over Mexica rulers Acamapictli, Huitzilihuitl, and Chimalpopoca from 1372 to 1427. However, with Tezozomoc's death, Maxtla assumed power and conflicts arose. Itzcoatl, the uncle of the slain Chimalpopoca, allied with the ex-ruler of Texcoco, Nezahualcoyotl, and besieged Maxtla's capital, Azcapotzalco. After Maxtla's surrender, Tenochtitlan, Texcoco, and Tlacopan united to form the formidable Triple Alliance becoming the dominant force in the Valley of Mexico. This was a military and economic partnership that facilitated the rapid expansion of Aztec territory. Under the reign of Itzcoatl's nephew, Motacuzoma I, in 1449, the empire's borders expanded. His son, Axayacatl, extended the realm by conquering Tlatelolco and various surrounding territories. The Mexica continued to grow, incorporating lands such as Matlazinka, Tolocan, Oquilan, and Malinalco. In 1481, Axayacatl's son, Tizoc, briefly ruled but was considered weak and possibly met with foul play, making way for his younger brother, Ahuitzol, who reorganized the army. 
the empire reached its zenith during his rule. Most of the Aztec Empire's formidable expansion and governance was attributed to one individual, Tlaquelel, a name that translates to manly heart in Nahuatl. He lived from 1397 to 1487 and played a pivotal role in shaping the empire's destiny. Although he was offered the opportunity to become a ruler, he chose to operate from behind the throne, acting as the empire's chief counselor. Tlacailil was the nephew of Tlatoani Itzcoatl and the brother of Chimalpopoca and Motecuzoma Ilhuicamina. His official title was Tzihuacoatl, an honorific link to the goddess that was roughly equivalent to counselor. However, as recorded in the Ramirez Codex, what Tlacailil ordered was as soon done. Tlacailil introduced a new structure to the Aztec government and ordered the burning of most Aztec manuscripts, claiming they were filled with falsehoods. He rewrote the Aztec history, effectively shaping a new narrative. Additionally, he reformed the Aztec religion by elevating the tribal god Huitzilopochtli to the same level as the traditional Nahua deities Tlaloc, Tezcatlipoca, and Quetzalcoatl. One of Tlacailel's significant contributions was the institution of ritual warfare, known as the Flowery Wars. This practice served as a means to train skilled warriors and also created the imperative for constant sacrifices to keep the sun moving. The foundation of Aztec social organization rested on the division of society into two primary classes, the nobility and the commoners. The nobility was a hereditary group that held significant political positions and controlled the majority of economic resources in Aztec society. At the highest echelon of nobility was the king, or Tlatuani. High-ranking chiefs with pivotal political and military roles bore the title Tecuhtli, while other nobles were referred to as Pili. Originally, nobility was not hereditary, and individuals could ascend to this status based on their abilities in various aspects of life, including warfare. Over time, the class system became increasingly hereditary, making it easier for sons of Pilas to become nobles. Warfare was a central aspect of Aztec culture, with boys receiving early training as warriors. Those who captured four or more prisoners earned the esteemed titles of Jaguar or Eagle Knights, adorning themselves in brilliantly colored feathered bodysuits. Meanwhile, girls were prepared for the challenges of childbirth, with those who died during labor becoming goddesses, accompanying the sun across the sky daily from noon until sunset. To become a Pili, an Aztec individual typically had to demonstrate prowess in war. Full-time warriors were only those who had successfully taken prisoners in battle, and the spoils and honors of war would eventually grant them noble status. Achieving the ranks of Eagle or Jaguar Knight, often translated as Captain, was an important step for these warriors, with the highest ranks of Tlacatecatl reserved for the elite. To be eligible for election as Tlatuani, one needed to have captured around 17 prisoners in battle. Aztec boys would often grow their hair until they took their first captive. The absence of captives would relegate a warrior to the commoner class, which was considered shameful for those aspiring to be warriors. Thus, many preferred to be Makahuali to maintain their honor. Social distinctions within the nobility were evident through tribute payments, with lower-ranking nobles paying tribute to kings and the size of the nobles' houses or palaces. Nobles formed alliances with peers in different city-states through arranged marriages and other ties, creating a vast network of kinship and cooperation that transcended political boundaries. Over 90% of the Aztec population comprised commoners. Within this class, there was substantial variation in wealth and status. Most commoners were members of Calpolis, territorial-based social groups that cooperated economically and socially. Although nobles owned the land, rural Calpolis were responsible for allocating plots to individual farmers. Some commoners, however, had fewer liberties and were more directly subject to nobles, resembling European feudal serfs in many aspects. At the lowest rung of the social hierarchy were the slaves, known as Tlacotin, a non-hereditary group often engaged in personal service to their owners. While commoners could not ascend to nobility, various avenues for social mobility existed. Success in battle brought status and privileges, 
and individuals engaged in trade and priesthood could advance to higher levels of wealth and status. The influx of tributes into the empire's coffers led to the rise of a third class that was not part of traditional Aztec society, the Pochtecas, or traders. Beyond commerce, they served as an effective intelligence-gathering force. While they were often scorned by the warriors, the spoils of war were often sent to them in exchange for various goods, including blankets, feathers, and slaves. It's estimated that only around 20% of the population was engaged in agriculture and food production. The majority of Makahuali dedicated themselves to arts and crafts. Tlaquelel's significant contributions to Aztec governance, religion, and culture reshaped the empire, fostering a shared historical consciousness among its people. The Aztec social structure, with its divisions among nobility, commoners, and slaves, played a crucial role in the empire's organization and cohesion. The Aztec economy revolved primarily around agriculture, with staple crops such as maize, beans, amaranth, and squash playing a central role. Innovations like the construction of stone terraces in hilly areas, damming rivers for canal irrigation, and the creation of raised fields known as chinampas transformed shallow, swampy lakes into highly fertile fields. Chinampas, often referred to as floating gardens, became a crucial resource for feeding the growing population of Tenochtitlan. To create chinampas, areas were marked out in the lake and a foundation of intertwined reeds, twigs, and branches was woven. Mud from the lake bed, mixed with decaying vegetation, formed fertile soil for farming. Willow trees were strategically planted as windbreakers, and regular maintenance, including the use of human manure as fertilizer, ensured the productivity of these remarkable agricultural plots and kept the city clean. The late Aztec period, spanning from 1350 to 1520 AD, was marked by a significant population surge. The Aztec population swelled from approximately 500,000 individuals to over 3 million. The central Mexican landscape became a tapestry of settlements and agricultural practices intensified to feed the burgeoning populace. City-state rivalries intensified, and by 1400, much of central Mexico fell under the control of small-scale empires centered in cities like Azcapotzalco, Texcoco, Cuauhnawa, and a few others. By 1519, the Aztec cycle of conquest and exploitation reached its zenith. An ever-growing number of conquered peoples contributed tribute forming the bedrock of the Aztecs' vast wealth. The empire initiated an expansion through military conquest. In the vibrant world of the Aztecs, every city and village boasted its own market, typically situated near the city center. Tlatelolco, the sister city to Tenochtitlan, hosted the grandest market, attracting a bustling crowd of 60,000 people daily. Much like modern markets, these bustling hubs offered a wide array of utilitarian goods. Merchants traded in cloth, garden produce, food animals, obsidian knives and tools, medicines, wood, leather, furs, animal skins, precious metals, gems, and pottery. Bartering with cacao beans was a common practice, and these markets were not just places of commerce, but vibrant social centers. It was a space to swap news, share gossip, and forge connections. In the teeming regional markets, the heartbeat of Aztec society pulsed with the rhythm of commerce and camaraderie. In the heart of Tenochtitlan stood the Templo Mayor, or Main Temple. This majestic structure, reaching about 90 feet in height, held unparalleled significance in Aztec life, serving as the focal point for ritual and ceremonial activities. The Templo Mayor consisted of two stepped pyramids, rising side by side on an expansive platform. This monumental complex symbolized two sacred mountains. The left pyramid represented Tonacatepetl, the hill of sustenance, devoted to Tlaloc, the ancient god of rain. On the right stood the hill of Coatepec, the birthplace of Huitzilopochtli, the Aztec war god. The temple structures atop each pyramid were dedicated to these vital deities. Access to their shrines was granted by broad staircases, adorned with serpent-headed balustrades. 
The serpent, a prominent symbol, also graced the wall surrounding the sacred precinct, known as the Coatapantli, or Serpent Wall. This precinct, measuring 365 meters on each side, held numerous structures, but the Templo Mayor towered above them all. The Templo Mayor, with its soaring presence and rich symbolism, must have dominated the city skyline, a visual testament to the spiritual and cultural significance of the Aztec capital. To the Aztecs, death held a profound significance in the cyclical nature of creation, a symbiotic dance between gods and humans, each responsible for the continuation of life. The act of sacrifice, both human and animal, played a pivotal role in maintaining the delicate balance. Aztec cosmology dictated that the sun god, Huitzilopochtli, engaged in an eternal struggle against darkness. The survival of the world rested on the sun's victory. To keep the sun moving across the sky and ensure their own existence, the Aztecs believed in feeding Huitzilopochtli with the sacred offerings of human hearts and blood. In a latter period, when Hernán Cortés and his men arrived in the heart of the Aztec capital, Tenochtitlan, in 1521, they were confronted with a gruesome spectacle. Aztec priests, wielding razor-sharp obsidian blades, performed sacrificial ceremonies that involved slicing open the chests of victims, offering their still-beating hearts to the gods, and discarding lifeless bodies down the steps of the towering Templo Mare. Andres de Tapia, a conquistador, vividly described rounded towers flanking the Templo Mare made entirely of human skulls, a chilling testament to the scale of human sacrifice. Some rituals reportedly included acts of cannibalism, with captors and their families, consuming parts of the sacrificed captives' flesh. All of these things did happen, but it is important to remember that for the Aztecs, the act of sacrifice, of which human sacrifice was only a part, was a strictly ritualized process which gave the highest possible honor to the gods and was regarded as a necessity to ensure mankind's continued prosperity. The speedily growing Aztec Empire took a new turn when Spanish conquistadors expanded their reach into the Americas during the early 16th century. Their journey led them west into Mexico. The Aztecs, at the height of their power, controlled a vast empire composed of 400 to 500 subjugated states. The Tlatoani, or ruler Montezuma II, presided over this empire, demanding tributes from the conquered, often in the form of human sacrifices. However, the cross-cultural expanse of the empire became both its strength and its vulnerability. The Aztecs' demand for tributes, particularly human sacrifices, did not sit well with some vassal tribes. In 1519, Spanish conquistador Hernán Cortés landed on the Yucatán Peninsula, unaware of the extent of the Aztec empire. Cortés, forging alliances with dissatisfied Aztec subject tribes, including the Totonac and the Tlaxcalans, marched on the city of Cholula. There, he slaughtered thousands of citizens after learning of their plan to ambush the Spanish. Cortés then set his sights on the important Aztec city of Tenochtitlan, aiming to conquer it and depose Montezuma. Upon reaching Tenochtitlan, Montezuma, instead of attacking, welcomed Cortés. The conquistador, however, observed Montezuma's military strength and resolved to seize the city. Cortés placed Montezuma under house arrest, making him a puppet king. The conquistador's victory was short-lived, as internal conflicts and the return of a Spanish arrest party threatened his position. Cortés left Tenochtitlan in the hands of Pedro de Alvarado, his trusted officer. During Alvarado's rule, a massacre of Aztec nobles and warriors at a religious festival triggered a citywide revolt. Cortes returned to find devastation, and Montezuma, either killed or assassinated, was replaced by his brother, Cuitlahuac. To make the matters worse, the smallpox virus entered the scene. Smallpox, introduced by the Spanish, wreaked havoc on Tenochtitlan. The Aztecs, lacking immunity, suffered a devastating toll. As the disease swept through the city, killing the emperor Cuitlahuac, 
Cuauhtémoc became the new Tlatoani. In a final assault known as La Noche Triste, the Spanish were driven out of Tenochtitlan. However, the conquistadors regrouped, and Cortés, with smallpox weakening the Aztecs, launched a relentless assault on Tenochtitlan. Over 93 days, the city's defenders were gradually worn down. Upon breaching the defenses, the Spanish and their allies engaged in ruthless conquest, marking the end of the Aztec Empire. Cortés declared Tenochtitlan his on August 13, 1521. The crusading friars, eager to promote Christianity and spread the teachings of the Roman Catholic Church, sought to eradicate native forms of worship, including human sacrifice and the construction of temples and pyramids. The subsequent years witnessed the swift collapse of the Aztec Empire, as Spanish rule extended across Mesoamerica, laying the foundations for the colonial regimes that transformed the Americas. After the destruction of Tenochtitlan, the Templo Mayor, like most of the rest of the city, was disassembled to be used as construction materials to create the Spanish colonial city. The temple's exact location was forgotten. The passage of time did what it often does, covered the past under the blanket of dust and made way to the new ways of life. In 1978, a serendipitous discovery beneath the bustling streets of Mexico City unveiled the remnants of the Aztec's Templo Mayor, a high temple that stood as a silent witness to the vibrancy of Aztec society. Since then, ongoing excavations by the National Institute of Anthropology and History's Urban Archaeology program have transformed our understanding of daily life, worship and governance during the zenith of Aztec rule. From the accidental unveiling of the Templo Mayor, to the revelation of a major ceremonial cachet under Plaza Manuel Gamillo in 2011. These archaeological treasures have offered a unique window into the heart of the Aztec capital. The PAU, over three decades, has meticulously excavated five key sites within a short walk of each other, unraveling the layers of history that lie beneath the modern cityscape. The Templo Mayor, the spiritual nucleus of Tenochtitlan, has yielded over a hundred ritual caches or deposits, revealing a treasure trove of objects associated with Aztec religious practices. These offerings provide a glimpse into the diverse facets of Aztec life and belief. Some contain items linked to water, including coral, shells, crocodile skeletons, and vessels depicting the revered deity Tlaloc. Others are connected to warfare and sacrifice, featuring human skull masks adorned with obsidian blade tongues and noses, as well as sacrificial knives. These caches often include artifacts from distant lands, likely representing places from which the Aztecs collected tribute, a testament to the vast reach of their empire. In a chilling discovery in recent times, archaeologists unearthed a tower of more than 650 skulls beneath the heart of Mexico City. This tower is believed to be part of the Huitzompantli, a massive array of skulls that struck fear into the Spanish conquistadores during their conquest. The skulls, embedded in lime, are believed to be associated with the god of war, Huitzilopochtli, and were likely created during the Flowery Wars. Researchers also uncovered a skull rack approximately 35 meters long and 5 meters high, featuring wooden posts and poles that once held human skulls. This structure was also described by Spanish explorers in their accounts of the Aztec capital. Two types of skull racks were used at Aztec religious sites. One was made purely from stone featuring symbolically carved skulls, like the one at the Great Temple. The other was typically much larger and made of wood, which displayed real human skulls to drive the point home. One skull wall is estimated to have been nearly 200 feet long and 100 feet wide at its peak. It would have been able to display tens of thousands of skulls, giving a chilling look at the sacrificial rituals of the ancient civilization. Archaeologists are still working to get to the tower's base, and many more skulls are waiting to be discovered. The ritualistic sacrifice seems macabre by today's standards. Researchers reiterate that ancient civilizations like the Aztec considered it an absolute necessity in order to sustain the gods, who would in turn allow humans to keep living too. Showcasing large numbers of sacrificed skulls and zompantles symbolize the strength of life more than any horrors of death.
This distinction was lost on, or intentionally ignored by, the Spanish conquistadors, who saw human sacrifice only as a savage practice and used it as one excuse to destroy the city of Tenochtitlan in 1521. Glass floors known as archaeological windows now dot the urban landscape, allowing glimpses into the ruins beneath contemporary Mexico City. These tangible remnants serve as poignant reminders of the once mighty empire that ruled over the basin of Mexico and much of northern Mesoamerica. The PAU's dedication to unearthing Mexico City's past has not only exposed significant Aztec structures, but has also revealed colonial artifacts, providing a comprehensive narrative of the city's evolution over centuries. As excavations continue, Archaeologists are piecing together the puzzle of what lies beneath the paving stones and buildings that now define modern Mexico City. In these archaeological windows, we witness the merging of past and present, a testament to the enduring legacy of the Aztec civilization. As the secrets of Tenochtitlan gradually come to light, they enrich our understanding of the complexities and grandeur of this ancient culture. Today, the profound and far-reaching influence of the Aztecs on modern Mexican society and culture is evident in various aspects of daily life, from cuisine to architecture, art, literature, and more. Nearly 500 years have passed since the conquest of Mexico in 1521 by Spanish forces. Today, Christianity is the prevailing religion in modern Mexico, with most Mexicans celebrating Christian holidays such as Christmas, Carnival, and Holy Week. However, the influence of pre-conquest religions persists. In many indigenous communities, ancient beliefs and customs coexist with Christianity, a phenomenon known as syncretism. <laughs> The blending of these religions reflects the rich cultural tapestry of Mexico. The Spanish conquistadors attempted to civilize the indigenous people, but the indigenous influence in the modern world still prevails. The descendants of the Aztecs, known as the Nahua, continue to play a significant role in modern Mexico. Over one and a half million Nahua live in small communities across rural areas, earning a living as farmers and artisans. While most Nahua worship in local churches and participate in Christian festivities, aspects of their distant past linger on. In the popular imagination, the Aztecs are often remembered as fierce warriors engaged in blood-curdling human sacrifice. However, they were much more than that. The Aztecs created one of the most sophisticated civilizations in Mesoamerica, undertaking massive engineering and building projects that rivaled, and in some instances, surpassed those in Europe at the same time. As we conclude our journey through the Aztec civilization, we're left with a profound appreciation for the resilience, creativity, and wisdom of this remarkable society. Thank you for joining us on this expedition through time. If you enjoyed this exploration of the Aztec civilization, be sure to like, subscribe, and hit the notification bell for more fascinating journeys through history. Until next time, keep exploring and learning.